Uh, the question that was asked this week um, was actually a very good question. Uh, they usually are. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying that they, that's not a thing. But it was a very good question in that it's an area that I think isn't really addressed a whole lot. Uh, will we know people in heaven how we do on now on earth? So when we're talking about um, the next life, a lot of times there's different ideas that people get that aren't overly accurate, but that are very widespread. So a couple of these, I wrote them down right here. Um, so a lot of people think that we become angels when we die. Um, but the Bible is very clear that angels are created servants or messengers of God and that we are under them for a little while and then in heaven we'll be over them. Um, another idea is that there's, <laughs> actually this is really popular on TVs and stuff, that we're going to sit on the clouds and play harps and <laughs> and it <laughs> that's <laughs> that's not an accurate depiction of heaven um at all uh the new earth nope that's nothing nothing there uh, another idea that people have is the idea that we're going to forget everything so basically i don't know call it divine amnesia if you will but once we die we're not going to remember any of this life and, and as a basic it's a really good idea behind it it's that how could we possibly be happy if we remember the things that happen here on earth? It's a good thought, but that's not really backed up from Scripture. So let's kind of plow through that and, and, and look, at this, look at this question. Will we know people in heaven how we do here on earth? Uh, I'm going to give a two-part answer. But before I do that, let me just say the short answer, yes. Yes, we will. But now let me give, me, <laughs> let me give you my, my actual answer. So first thing, people have bodies of some sort even right now in heaven and hell. Some sort. We don't know exactly what this is not like, and it's going to be a different body in the resurrection. Um, I don't know if it's going to look the same or not, but it's not going to be capable of sin the same way as this body is. However, this body that people have in heaven and hell right now um, is not the same body that you have on right now. So when you die, your body turns to dust. It stays there in the grave, or it's cremated, or whatever. Um but it's not really tied to you anymore. And in, in heaven or hell, whichever one you <laughs> end up in, <laughs> uh, you do still have a body of some sort. So uh, let's take some biblical um, passages and kind of help to apply this. Jesus tells a story um, about a rich man and uh, a guy named Lazarus. And the rich man has all of his pleasure on earth, and then he dies, and he goes to hell or Hades, and the poor man ends up being at Abraham's side, which is um, kind of like a term for heaven. And there's some very important things that happen in this story. Um, the first one is that Lazarus, Lazarus is with Abraham. It clearly labels the man as Abraham, meaning that he is the same person. Um, and Lazarus is also named as the same person. Um, the rich man felt pain, which would seem to imply some kind of a body. And also he mentions to dip his finger in the water, which implies the presence of a finger. Uh, so you have a lot of different things there um, that, that kind of seem to imply that. Uh, next off is on the Mount of Transfiguration, and I think it's in a couple different Gospels, but the one I'm thinking of is in Matthew. Um, and the Mount of Transfiguration Moses and Elijah come and meet with Jesus on the, on the mountain, and they are recognizable people. They have a body, they are recognizable, and um, th that kind of seems to imply the idea that, you know, they, they're still known, they still have bodies, they still have, they still know what's going on. They didn't seem to be confused at the Transfiguration, they kind of seem to know what's going on. And then the third uh, story I want to bring up is from the Old Testament. King Saul has outlawed, outlawed all the witches and everything. Well, then he has a problem because he wants to hear from God, but God won't talk to him. <laughs> so the prophet that he would have gone to has died. And so he's in a little bit of a pickle. He has no idea what to do. So uh, he decides uh, <laughs> somewhat poorly <laughs> to uh, find a witch for himself and uh, ask her to have a seance uh, to bring Samuel up so he can ask him that way. You know, ha-ha, beat the system there. Uh, <laughs> but obviously this wasn't a good thing that he did. However, when, when Samuel comes up in the seance, he's recognizable as Samuel. 
he still has a memory of Saul. He still knows what the situation is. So it seems like none of that has gone away. And um, I do want to mention that normally in seances, what happens is a, is a demon will come, will come up in the seance and will kind of take on the image of the person and they'll talk about stuff as if they were the person who was there because they saw it happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they, um, for them, it's not, this isn't that big of a deal. But in this story, the witch actually gets scared when Samuel comes up because it was actually Samuel. It wasn't just a demon pretending to be Samuel. It was actually the real deal. And she's like, oh, how? <laughs> and so that, that, that tells us a lot of things um, right there about kind of the next life. So then the second point I want to make is um, your memories are not taken away from you when you die. Uh, we'll kind of, first off, let's answer the question very quickly. How can we remember what happened without having great sorrow? Well, there's two different things that I want to say and answer that. The first one is the resurrected body is not going to see things in the same light that your body now sees them as. See, we experience great um, depression in a lot of situations because of things like when a loved one dies, what's What's significant about that one over all the other millions of people that are dying in the world? Well, you knew them personally. That's what makes it different. Well, in the new heavens and new earth, you, you get what I'm getting at here? You're not going to have the same familial tie as you do now. So it, you're going to feel a lot differently about things. But that's even without the resurrection. Then with the resurrected body, you're just not going to see things in the same light. And the second thing I want to say about that is the presence of God will be there. Not like how he is now, but I mean like all up in your business. You know what I mean? You know, in, in face-to-face kind of stuff going on. It's going to be a whole different ballgame. Uh, but so to move on with this thing, when, when, um, when I, the story that I mentioned with the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man was able to discern um, who Lazarus was as well as Abraham. And he hadn't ever even seen Abraham. and He was still able to discern that it was Abraham. Um, in Revelation, it talks about the martyrs and how they have knowledge of what's going on on earth, and they're crying out to God, how long before you put an end to this? They're seeing it happening. Um, and they obviously didn't get amnesia. They know what's going on. Uh, the next thing, um, in Hebrews, we're going to look at this more in a couple weeks, but it mentions a cloud of witnesses, which could possibly mean um, that they are currently aware of what's going on and they're watching us. We'll get more into that later, but... There is at least the possibility of that. And then the last thing is, um, in, in the next life, we're going to have more revelation, not less. So let me read a verse really quick, and I hope that this explains what I'm, what I'm saying. 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve says, Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, now notice this, even as I am fully known. And... Uh, so I think sometimes we get this idea that heaven's going to be a shadow of now when the truth is now is a shadow of heaven. We're going to have greater revelation, greater clarity, greater vision than we have now. So the short answer is yes, you will have a recognizable body, you will remember, and you will still experience in heaven, and you will remember your experiences here on earth. Um, all those things, uh, yes. And yes, people now currently in heaven do still have um, a body of some sort. We just don't know all the specifics, but I tell you what, when you get there, you can write it in a book. Uh, I'm not really going to care when I get there. I'm going to have other things on my mind. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide there, buddy. Uh, we are going to just take a couple minutes to pray. Just push down. I'm just gonna yeah, go ahead. Okay. It's not till the fourth plague, the flies, that the point is made. Um, God says, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there. So he's going to make this distinction. It, it never came up in the first three plagues. Uh, so I was just wondering, did Israel have to experience the first three plagues with the Egyptians? Blood, water to 
the, the rivers turn to blood, and then the frogs, and then the gnats. So without, without being there in person, I'm going to offer what I believe um, the text gives warrant to. And my assumption is, when I read in Exodus that it says the waters turn to blood, my assumption is that that was all of the waters. Um, it seems to really be implying that. And we know that the area that Israel lived in was in northern Egypt. So the water of the Nile goes from south to north. So that would mean, if my understanding is correct, that yes, they would have had to go through that plague because the blood would have been going through their land. Now, if, if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm totally okay with people, if you've got any extra stuff to say. Um, and then my assumption is also that the frogs at least have something to do with the... Just a minute, Paul. Sit down, don't get up, bud. Don't do that again. That's not okay. My assumption is that the frogs have at least something to do with the blood. Um, I'm assuming that it caused somewhat of a problem for the frogs in the Nile and that they hopped out and were kind of being a pestilence because their homeland was kind of being, their ecosystem was being kind of messed up. If I'm right in that, then that would also kind of stand the argument that they probably um, went on the land of Israel as well. And then the third one was the flies? Gnats. Um, that also might, ha there's a possibility that that was related to, because with all these frogs, it's possible that they, you know, kind of died and the flies kind of, or gnats kind of gathered around it. If they are connected, it kind of argues for the, for the idea that um, Israel had to go through all of it. But assuming that they're not connected, my assumption is yes, they did have to go through the same plagues, um, which <laughs> is kind of funny. <laughs> Kind of funny, you know, um, sometimes we want God to redeem us without experiencing anything <laughs> bad. Uh, I was, <laughs> maybe this is off topic, but I remember there's this one person that was praying for God to bring them healing. And he did, he did, but they had to still go to the doctor and go through this kind of invasive thing just for the doctor to turn around and say, it's gone, I don't know what happened. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes God has us go through that. So the question is, if Israel did go through those first three, why would God have done that? Let's kind of turn this into discussion here. Why, why would God have had them go through the first three? Any ideas? It kind of seems like it would be kind of irritating. <laughs> Couldn't you just... <laughs> well, I guess the rain falls on the righteous and the wicked, huh? But yeah, I, I, that's my assumption that uh, Israel had to go through at least some of them. But, uh, yeah, good uh, good point. Was there anything anything else that somebody wanted to add to that? Sometimes I feel like my answers are just kind of non-answers. 